with the orangutan and uh, orangutan is is uh, different in Sumatra and uh, Kalimantan. In Kalimantan, so far I know this call it Pongo uh, Pengegius, and it bigger than in in, Kalim in Sumatra. And lifespan might be more than uh, 35 to 40 years old, but in capture in the captive might be get longer might, until 60 60 year. Then we have a problem now. We we want to understand uh, from Dr. Aga and Dr. Uh, Panda how is the uh, what uh, orangutan in Kalimantan and maybe. A uh, little bit the uh, reference in Sumatra, uh, maybe Dr. Arga uh, can explain to us. I think uh, nothing to say again. Maybe we can just uh, see what uh, the two speaker and two expert uh, explain us uh, about the problem of orangutan uh, in Kalimantan as well as in Sumatra. Thank you so much. Uh, have a nice. Uh, webinar for today with special topic with orangutan that we have uh, two species in Indonesia. One is orangutan and another one is a uh, Komodo. This endangered species that still live, still uh, found in our country in Indonesia, only in Indonesia, not other else. Thank you so much. Have a nice uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Putu. Yes, thank you very much, Prof. Ayan, for a warm introduction and also speech. Okay, so I will not uh, doing any further ado. We will move to the next session. Um, one more thing I would like to give you the agenda of today's webinar. So wait a minute. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, we already have the opening by Prof. Ayan, and the first session we will approve uh, by uh, Ms. Adventus Panda MSI. He will talk about, he comes from the University of Palangkaraya, Central Kalimantan. Good afternoon, Pak Panda, Mr. Pak Panda. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you for coming today. He will talk about the animal behavior, yeah. ecology, and animal conflict. And the second speaker will go to um, Dr. Arga Sawung Kusuma, DBM. He is a veterinarian come from Borneo Orang Utan Survival Foundation, Nyaru Menteng, Central Kalimantan. Good afternoon, uh, Hi, Dr. Buddy. Arga. Uh, yeah. Hello, good afternoon, Dr. Putu. Nice to meet nice. you. Yeah, it's nice mm -hmm. to meet you too. Thank you very much for coming today. And Dr. Arga will, will talk about potential zoonotic disease transmission by Orang Utan. And uh, after all of the speakers already finished their presentation, we will move to the Q&A session. Um, if all of you are worried with your English, it's okay if you, if you write your question in Indonesia. And the question, you, your question you can type on the pigeonhole uh, link we will share in the chat room. And then you can, you can just simply click uh, the link there and then uh, write on your question. And don't forget to click the tag. Those tag is uh, for which speaker you want to uh, drive the, the questions. And then uh, the last but not least, we will go to the closing session. Okay, and uh, this is the housekeeping items that all of every, everyone have to pay attention. Um, first, please rename yourself with the format participants, underscore name, and then underscore institution and the country. And please mute your microphone when you are not talking um, participant may ask the speaker during the webinar through this link, the pigeonhole that I just mentioned before. But don't worry, uh, our committee will share the link in the chat room so you can look for the information in the chat room. And other issues may be asked in the chat room. The link for the certificate will be shared at the end of the webinar. The speaker's material and certificate will be shared through email with the permission by the speakers. And also about the attendance form, we will, we will share it at the end of the session. Okay, and then I will invite to our beautiful moderator, Kesara Sastrin. Hello, good afternoon, Sastrin. Good afternoon, Putu. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. But let me introduce you to our participants. 
Okay, Dr. Sastrin, uh, she's a staff of One Health Collaborating Center, Universitas Gajah Mada, and she's a lecturer in the lecturer in Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Sebelas Maret or UNS, and uh, she's got her DVM degree from Faculty of Veterinary Medicine with cum laude as third best graduated student, Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia, and finished his master degree from Animal Sciences, Wageningen University and Research in the Netherlands. She got PBA scholarship for her bachelor and LPDP scholarship for her master degree. She was a mahasiswa prestasi 2014 in UKM, and she has been managing one health projects such as summer course, webinars, OHSC, COVID-19 research webinars, handbook, flyers, and policy brief. And uh, she works for parasitology and prospective animal laboratory in UNS, and her research of interest are identify, identifying pathogens molecular and serologically using PCR and ELISA and other methods, zoonotic and emerging infectious diseases, and interdisciplinary approach for one health in animal and human medicines. Thank you very much. Um, the screen I will give to you, Dr. Sastrin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Putu. Uh for giving the participants my academic and career overview. I will directly start our session today. Our first speaker will be Pak Panda. I see that he's already with us today. Hello, Pak Panda, how are you? Hello. Are you ready for your session? Yeah, we hope so. <laughs> yes, okay. So I will give introduction to uh, about Pak Panda to all of the participants. So, uh, Pak Panda or uh, Mr. Panda, uh, the, his long name is Adventus Panda, uh, MSE. Uh, he is from University of Palangkaraya, Central Kalimantan, and he will give a talk about animal behavior, ecology, and animal conflict. So his education uh, in his bachelor degree in 2000 in biology, uh, in Atmajaya University of Yogyakarta. And then he continued his master in environmental science, uh, subject environmental biology in UGM. And now he is doing his uh, doctoral degree, I think uh, with Profayan as well, right? Um, okay, and then for his uh, working experience uh, from September 2003 to February 2004, he was a limnologist with Lens International Indonesia program, Central Kalimantan Peat Forest program. And then uh, he worked uh, from 2004 to 2015 in conserv uh, as conservation biologist in w uh, WF Indonesia program, Central Kalimantan Indonesia. And now he is a lecturer in University of Kalangkaraya, Central Kalimantan Indonesia and the specialty is animal ecology. His interest is in wildlife, conservation, and natural resources management. Okay, so uh, let's welcome uh, Panda. Please, the time and screen is yours. Okay, thank you, Mbak Sastrin, uh, for this great opportunity for me to share the knowledge about the orangutan all the participants, good afternoon. I see Prochut is already joined with us. Good afternoon, Prochut, and as well as Propoyan. I'd like to share my screen and hope everyone can see. Yes, everyone. Can see my screen? Yes, fine. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I will proceed to the presentation. Well, actually, I have to put uh, an introduction to the to the disease because I have the topic, the orangutan's ecology behavior context, and I will add some point for diseases before Dr. Uh, Graha will be continuing with the specific topic on zoonotic. And before we move on, uh, the material presented on this talk are part of ongoing 
research. First of all, it's orangutan parasite burden in Sibangau National Park, Central Kalimantan. Uh, and the second one is the importance of understanding orangutan social organization, life history, skill acquisition and culture, energetic and ranging in one orangutan in Tuana, Central Kalimantan, and the importance of long-term monitoring for orangutan in Subangau Forest. These are the presentation of light. First, we will have distribution, and then we can see the population status, the behavior, threats, and way forward, and lastly, the acknowledgement. This map is uh, showing the Sumatran and Bornean orangutan distribution. This is uh, come from the PHPA, which stands for Population and Habitat Viability Analysis in 2016, whereas we have, as Papuayan said, that we have two distinct species of the orangutan. First one is Pongo uh, Abeli in Sumatra, and the second one is Pongo Pygmius in Borneo. Then <clears throat> we will see this by one by one, by one. in Sumatra. Uh, the most the most location of this uh, population of distribution in Sumatra is in the North Sumatra. And, and the middle part of the Sumatra is the Bukit Tigapulu landscape. But then in 2017, we have the uh, confirmed a new species called Pongo tapanuiensis. And we can, for, for further detail, uh, the, everyone can uh, look to this paper, title Morphometric Behavioral and Genomic Evidence for a New Orangutan Species. And it is located in Batang Toro Forest in North Sumatra. So overall, that now we, in total, we have five subspecies of orangutan in Indonesia. In Sumatra, we have two subspecies. The first one is Pongo abeli, and the second one is Pongo tapanoviensis. Whereas in Borneo, we have three subspecies. In the upper one, in the upper part is the Pongo pygmius morio, and the middle part is Pongo pygmius pygmius, and in the southern part is Pongo pygmius rumbii. This is the uh, the distinct genomic profile for the new orangutan Pongo tapanuliensis in North Sumatra. And this is how uh, how the, the new species have been uh, applied according to the evolution theory, which is the allopatric evolution mode of speciation. And then for Borneo, this is the Pomo pygmius morio distribution. And this one is Pomo pygmius pygmius distribution. And the latter is the Pomo pygmius bumbii distribution. For the population status, for the whole Borneo species, for the last 40 years, we have 51.4% uh, 50, decreasing and it's continuing. If the, this, the habitat disturbance is continuing like today. And this is the overview of the uh, 
the comparison between Sumatra and Borneo orangutan in terms of uh, what is it we call the, the 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 diet preference in Sumatra we can see that most of the subspecies is dominantly eat on pigs, insects, and other. Whereas in Borneo, there is an increased reliance on vegetation and inner bark, especially for the Pomo pygmies morio. And then we move on to the relationship among behavioral ecology, masticatory morphology, brain size, and life history in hominoid. This is the uh, comparison between uh, other uh, great primates in Indonesia and Africa. As we can see, this is the degree of progipary is found to the height in Pongo Angeli, or in Pongo Pygmius Wundi is intermediate, and then for Pongo Pygmius Morio is low. As, uh, as Propoyan has stated in his introduction, the inter interbird interval for Pongo, Pongo species is related to uh, one as six point one to eight point seventy five years. Okay, we can move on. This is the <coughs> the morphomet from the M one corpus depth shape, and then in this one I can show the pointer. We can see this is the Comparative morphometry from Pomo Abeli, Pomo, Pomo Pygmius Morio, and Pomo Pygmius Wumbii. And the, sec, uh, the next one is Sympathesis Depth Shape. And the, the third one is Sympathesis Width Shape, this area, actually. And the one is Collinar Area. This one. And as you can see, the box plot comparing jaw shape in three subspecies Pomo Abeli, Pomo Pygmius Wumbi, and Pomo Pygmius Morio. Compared to Pomo Abeli, Pomo Pygmius Morio is relatively more robust in all dimensions, and Pomo Pygmius Wumbi I relatively more robust in all dimensions, except or synthesis depth. And then we can move to the next slide. This graphic is showing the average intervals, interval in year and brain size in, <coughs> in volume. As we can see, the, the Pomo Pygmies Morio is as uh, as stated earlier, is uh, in average having 6.1 years inter interbird interval. And then the highest one is Pomo Abeli with the lifespan up to 9.25 years. For the activity budgets for each each sex class at each site. We have nine sites here. Uh, it comprised in Sumatra and Borneo. In Suwak Balimbi, we can see that the most, uh, I'm sorry, the most uh, three, the three most, uh, uh, what is it called, the behavior for this orangutan, the most dominant behavior is feeding, stand for cat, and R is resting, and traveling is uh, have highest score in Tanjung Puting for unplanned smells. For the plain males, is 
63.8 in Subangao. And for the sexually active female, the highest one is 61.6 in Subangao. And non-sexually active females is highest 61.9 in feeding rate. Whereas in resting, we have the, the highest one is in Kinabatangan, 55.3. For the untrained males, for plain males, we have uh, for the resting is in Kinabatangan 56.7, and for the sexually active females, the highest is uh, for resting is the Gunung Palu, account for 53.7. And lastly, for the non-sexual active female, the highest in Gulung Palung account for 47.2, all in percentage. This is the event where yes, the forest fire have, uh, you know, have, uh, have impacted the orangutan behavior. We have three study periods here, pre-smoke, then smoke occur, and then post-smoke. As we can see, between six uh, parameter, which is rest time, travel time, travel distance, active period, energy intake and ketone pos positive for, uh, sorry, what is it called? Samples positive for ketones and percents is showing that the forest fire have impacting their uh, mobility in smoke hazard in 2015. And then we move on to the phenological studies. The data that we have, uh, especially for more of Bernard at all, then it is account for September 2003 up to June 2007. We can see that the fruit periods and flowering periods is fluctuated over time. And then we have here, in 2005, we have the peak, the highest peak on flowering, whereas the fruit is decreasing for the lowest level, uh, below 10%. This is indicate that the smoke has affecting the strategy for the for aging of the orangutan. And then, uh, so far the, the conclusion for the penological study, especially in Sabangau and Kuana, in 2006, ex exhibited the largest amount of particulate matter produced. And this is followed by 2015 event. Living immediately decreases with smoke present, potentially because of reduce in photosynthesis. Increased smoke triggers flowering immediately. However, these flowers do not develop into fruit, and it takes seven to 10 months for a forest to recover. This is uh, uh, what is it called? The, the list of the three species that I that are uh, targeting for the logging concession at the time of the study, especially at PT Setia Alam Jaya, now is becoming the the laboratory for lahan gambut sintro. You can see in the red phone, the Bintangur, Kapurnaga, 
kalau film and your talk is uh, tree uh, representative of orangutan feeding trees as you can see on the left hand side but after the logging concession has been uh, finished or stopped it is continued to what we call a phase uh, illegal logging and what actually happened in the area in Sabangal case as you can see the number of the trees have been cut down is uh, mostly is including the orangutan feeding tree especially for jelutung as well jelutung is one of the traditional latex that the community collect for uh, making a what is it called uh, a rubber. So many tree species are illegally locked from 1997 to 2005 were important orangutan food. This is uh, that this made the Savannah with uh, the, the forest condition is called lock over forest. And from the, uh, what is it called? The plant part that have uh, eaten by the orangutan, as you can see in the hybrid availability, most, most of the orangutan still consuming the fruit. Yeah, yeah absolutely, because it is high fruit availability, but there there were also 14% still eating on leaves, whereas below 6 to 1% is flower, insects, and other vegetation. As we can see in low fruit availability, uh, amount of 47% still rely on fruit. This is Actually, in Sabangau case, is uh, feeding on leptopoda, uh, leptopoda, at what we call in uh, diatnis is pisang pisang, and for account for twenty one percent is still feeding on leaves, and the rest is flower or bark or insects and other vegetation and orangutan was so unique because they can uh, learn from either from their peer or their mother or even from humans so this is the, the term that they uh, one side can and the colleagues call culture. It means it socially transmit knowledge and skill. And what skills are learned by the orangutan or socially? They seem to learn most of their skills socially. There are two distinctive uh, skills they have learned. First one is high complexity skill. And this is, uh, I can show you, and this is uh, referred to the tool use number four. And this is all observed in SWAC uh, area, while in Tuanan still come for zero. This is uh, what we call a high complexity skill, whereas the substance Subsistence skill is nesting, moving, social, feeding, others, and vocalization. This is the this is uh, one that we can uh, highlight that even we as a researcher uh, thought that we will uh, studying the orangutan, 
but eventually they also learn what our uh, behavior when we uh, observe them so it is something like a, a two ways learning actually happen in the in the forest and the other behavior that is uh, will actually need to improve in the in the next couple of years i think because we we see that the orangutan have the ability to medicate themselves. This is referred to the terminology for zoopharmacognosy. And there are two papers already uh, published regarding this uh, self-medication in Sabango. While we haven't heard the, the other published paper in other area, but I think this is something that we need to improve in the next in the next year. And we we are hypothesized that the traditional healers who acquire their knowledge for uh, what is it called for for treat the patient were were have their ability because they have uh, watching the orangutan is uh, medicate them so this is what we had found so far that the traditional healer was actually learned from the orangutan how to uh, treat something regarding to the, the health and <clears throat> we are come to the section that uh, really, really confusing, as we can see in the screen that there are two points that we need to uh, uh, put into consideration. The first one is loss of carrying capacity, and the second one is direct loss of around time. This is uh, eventually will lead to the orangutan viability in their natural habitat as well as the anthropogenic uh, habitat as well. As you can see, <coughs> uh, there are many forest conversion, including uncontrolled infrastructure development, road development, will lead to the increased forest access. This is mean that the human access to the forest is getting, uh, getting easy. So that will getting easily to the forest. And this, this is what the fragmentations will result in. And furthermore, they will have the habitat degradation. And related to our topic today, uh, there are two also uh, two activities, uh, two major activities that will put into a carefully consideration, which is translocation and tourism, will resulting in disease outbreak. This is where we. <clears throat> lead to direct loss of orangutan, more death, more extractions, or fewer birds. This is that uh, we call more than just conflict in, in uh, what is it called, in, in terms of spatial, uh, in terms of spatial uh, conflict, but rather than, than that, that the translocation and tourism will actually lead to the house uh, disease outbreak rather than hunting in breeding and lack of effective action for the uh, ranger store. Uh, the authority will also lead to the directness of the orangutan in the wild habitat. And this is the hypothetical statement 
uh, you can find in in Ford at all 2018 that in the absence of plausible alternative explanation for the loss of orangutan in seemingly intact habitat, such as the occurrence of widespread and highly lethal infectious disease, as observed among African apes, killing is the most likely explanation. This is uh, uh, impli 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 imply that if, if we cannot, uh, what is it, cover or to cope the why the orangutan in their natural habitat is keep uh, keeping decreasing. So the 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 main reason for us to, to say now is the killing. But actually, as I previously mentioned, there are two points that we need to put into a careful consideration so far. Uh, I will uh, skip this one because I think Dr. Agra will further discuss about this, but as for the introduction, the emerging infectious disease even are dominated by zoonosis, account for 60.3%. And the majority of this, 71.8%, originate in wildlife. And zoonosis itself is a disease that is caused by an infectious pathogen or parasite that originates, or this one is very important, is maintained in the wildlife by one or more non human causes, but can be transmitted to and cause disease in human. This is the, the distribution for the worldwide, whereas we can where we can see the distribution. For the primates, let's see in primates, that species with zoonosis it's account for this, this level. As you can see in, here in Indonesia, uh, sorry, this one is uh, yellow. Yeah. And for the next, this is also uh, very important for us that I would like to point out for the point B, this map is showing that there are still undiscovered parasite diversity. So you can see this is in Indonesia, it is very high level of undiscovered. This is tell us how the, if we can see in a point A map, the parasite fitness is still counting low, as well as the predicted risk here in the last map. But the thing is that the the research on parasite or other pathogens is really important for us now in Indonesia, especially if we can work in together through the One Health uh, scheme. This is the the number of the genera that will uh, acting as a pathogen. We can see the helminth, fungi protozoa, viruses, or prions, and bacteria, or rickettsia. Well, actually, this also will uh, explain further by Dr. Agra. This is how the land use will uh, affecting the orangutan, not only in their natural habitat, but also in the in outside the protected areas. As you can see here, that there are a scheme or skin area that like uh, the, the influence of the habitat loss as a threat, human orangutan conflicts 
anthropogenic activities and habitat fragmentation is uh, is categorized mild to strong related to the uh, activities where it is logging concession on natural forests, protected areas, timber concession, oil palm concession, and other infrastructure like in uh, like state in this slide. This is also showing that the rate of decline of orangutan over the last 10 years, as you can see, uh, in West Kalimantan, this rate of decline is account for 29.4. And <clears throat> in Central Kalimantan, account for 24.9%, while in the lowest is North Kalimantan. This is indicated as uh, what we have in further discussion. This is uh, something that we need to uh, uh, carefully measure because this is uh, actually derived from the modeling, which is comprised from combination of the field work and the modeling. Oh, yeah, so <clears throat> the rate of decline is somehow generalizing. And for the the social economic aspect. This is where the, actually I point out to the, the map. This is all the effort for something in orangutan, especially in Borneo orangutan. There are two, uh, two methods have been applied. The first one is line transit. And the second one is interview. While the presence is uh, related to the uh, the previous studies, but the thing is, when we say, when we see the the publication in 2011, which is quantifying killing of orangutan and human orangutan conflict in Kalimantan, Indonesia, and reinforced with this uh, publication. It's not just conflict that motivates killing of orangutan. This is something that very, very terrible. This is very frightening because as you can see, the most of the reason for killing the orangutan is for food. And the other reason is come from self-defense. This is something that we need to continuously educate the community. And this is cannot be done by ourselves. We need to collaborate on this. And this is not only in, Palang, uh, in Central Kalimantan. This is also applied elsewhere in Borneo Island. As, as well as in Sumatra Island. This is something something related to the previous slide. I can skip this one. And further uh, explanation will be uh, we have by Dr. Arga in this common parasite. Uh, <clears throat> this is something that I have to highlight. The parasite this one is, is called Mamo monogamus laryngeus. Uh, Roer reported uh, causing eight dead cases in Orangutan Rehabilitation Center in Baharok, Sumatra Utara, North Sumatra. This is only happened in five days after the, and the autopsies confirm that the mammal monogamous larynx is positive. And then from the malaria parasite on orangutan, I will skip this as well because the Dr. Arga will further explain about this. 
and for following up. As we've previously seen that the impact of around the uh, impact of habitat disturbance on primate health in this talk or in this context is uh, the orangutan. Intestinal parasite, prevalence of sensitive specificity and virulence is still poorly understood. And it is why we are trying to schematize this uh, diagram for this ongoing research. And as I mentioned earlier, that this work is impossible that if we only working by ourselves. But when it comes to uh, collaborating, communicating, and coordinating, as one health has proposed, this is something that is possible in the future. And with that, I would say thank you for your kind of attention. And I'm so glad that uh, I can share all this material today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pak Panda. Yeah. Uh, it's a very excellent presentation about orangutan ecology, behavior, uh, conflict, and diseases. We uh, also uh, understand more about orangutan than that actually orangutan is not only in Kalimantan, but also in Sumatra. I just know it. And uh, the subspecies of orangutan like uh, Pongo pygmeus in Borneo and Pongo ambeli and Tapal nunensis in Sumatra. We also know the population of orangutan is now decreasing and also the difference of feeding behavior of orangutan in Kalimantan and Sumatra. Also the activity of behavior of feeding, resting and traveling and also the, about the helical logging that uh, decreased the number of orangutan feeding tree. We also know the orangutan skills, the high complexity and substance skills, the substance that uh, like feeding and other, other usual skills, but the high complexity, this is interesting that orangutan are using tools uh, uh, that um, researchers observe the orangutan, but also orangutan observe the researcher, that's uh, the other way around, so it's so funny. And we also uh, understand that the threats are all connected, thus a one health collaboration is important that Papanda mentioned several times. And it, at the uh, end, Papanda also mentioned about the emerging uh, infectious diseases, and it, this will be delivered by Dr. Arga. Okay, thank you, uh, Pak Panda, for your nice uh, presentation. So we continue to the second speaker, uh, Dr. Arga. Okay, thank you, Putu, for sharing the screen. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Arga Sawung Kusuma, uh, veterinarian. He's a Borneo Orang Utan Survival Foundation, Nyaru Menteng, Menteng Central Kalimantan. And he will give a topic of potential zoonotic diseases transmission by orangutan. So he was a veterinarian from uh, Gajah Mada University in 2009. And he, get also, he got also PLN scholarship recipient in 2007. He worked um, in 2012 uh, veterinarian in, in Gibbons and Siamang Rescue Center, Kalawit Indonesia Foundation. Also in 2013, junior veterinarian in Bali Safari and Marine Park. And now uh, his uh, program and uh, in three introduction of uh, orangutan, um, Nyaru Menteng, Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation. And also he do uh, clinical uh, veterinarian in Sevepeni. Bersaudara. So he was the best medics in 2016 in Bos Foundation, Nyaru Menteng, and he also got a Browin Watson OVAD scholarship in 2019, United Kingdom. Wow, amazing. Uh, so please welcome uh, Dr. Arga. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Prime and screen is yours. 
Yeah. Wait a minute. Uh, let's see this one. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, thank you so much for having me here in front of all of you virtually. Thank you so much to Prof. Bayan and Dr. Sastrin, also Dr. Putu, and also Dr. Panda. Okay, so here this afternoon, I'm going to share my experience here in BOSF, Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation. My topic is potential zoonosis disease transmission by orangutan. Before I start my topic, first I have to introduce first where I work. So uh, this is where I work. I work in BOSF. BOSF is an Indonesian NGO. So this is a Indonesian NGO that established in 1991. 1991. It's dedicated to the conservation of the Borneo orangutan and their habitat. So actually our program is not only just rehabilitate orangutan. Um, we have four core strategies. So the first one, the first strategy is orangutan reintroduction. So here we do rescue, rehabilitate, and also release and do post monitoring. So it's mean that we are surrounding by orangutan or orangutan surrounding by us. Yeah. We are really close here in this reintroduction orangutan. That's why uh, the zoonosis disease has become more risky. And the second, second strategy is sanctuary care. The sanctuary care, we use it uh, for unreasonable orangutan. So in central Borneo, we have uh, Badak Island. So it's like around 200 hectares island. It's, just specific for unreleasable orangutan. And in is Kalimantan, we have SGO. So we design, design the exhibit just for unreleasable orangutan because we don't want the unreleasable orangutan just only stay in like a miserable place for whole life, something like that. So the, the third, uh, we have orangutan ecosystem conservation. As, as we knew, as we knew that it will, it will be useless if we and orangutan in natural habitat. So we also do coordinating with a coordinating law enforcement law enforcement and also government to con we develop the sustainable livelihood so because if we want to protect if we want to protect the forest we also have to pick again in the first strategy orangutan sorry uh, I just learned from the in Zoom. <laughs> so, hello. Your internet connection is unstable, but it's okay. Still move. Okay, so this is uh, So, we have in Menteng in Central. We also have East Kalimantan, Samalestari. So we move here. This is the place where I am. And then located in Samalestari. So we used to have like more than uh, like 500 orangutans. We can claim that we are the biggest rehabilitation center of the 
orangutan or great apes. But we are not proud of it because if we have a lot of orangutan, it means that there's still uh, forest destruction or so whatever, something like that. So, because we are going to talk about zoonosis, uh, first of all, from the... Sorry, uh, Dr. Arga, for yes. interrupting. Yeah. Uh, I think your network bandwidth is low, so maybe uh, Putu can help you share the screen and you can just talk because uh, we cannot really hear you clearly. Is that okay? Okay. okay. Oh yeah, and that's perfectly fine. Okay, uh, then uh, yes. please. Uh, you can start uh, with share slides. Do you want to? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, your your um, yeah your voice is okay, not okay. clear. Yeah. Okay, please Maybe wait for just a minute. It's yeah. processing and to open the document. I will stop share. Yeah, thank you. Is the orangutan traveling? <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Arga, traveling. Yeah, oh, hello, Prof. Mayan. <laughs> nice to meet hello. you again. After like 10 years ago, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Okay, now, Dr. Putu. Yes, it just appeared in my screen. Okay. Okay, yes. Please continue, okay. doctor. Maybe it's better uh, without. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Start from here, yeah? Okay. Okay, yes. now I'm working in Nyaru Menteng in central Kalimantan. So we used to have like more than 500 orangutan, but now we only, only, yeah, only have 297. It means uh, we already released. Uh, a lot, but it's still a big number for rehabilitation center. So we, are, we can claim that we are, it makes us uh, the biggest rehabilitation center in the world for the grid apps actually with this number, but we're not proud uh, at all because yeah, you know that. If we have a lot of orangutan, it means that destruction still everywhere. So yeah, we need to rehabilitate them as soon as possible. Okay, next, Dr. Putu. Doctor? Putu? Okay, okay yes. yes. Uh, okay, for based on according to Karaman 2000 entry, uh, comparative analysis of gene expression Human and grip is, is really close relative. We are really relative. And we share 97% um, of DNA with the orangutan. It means that maybe the disease is also similar and also same. And also based on taxonomy that we have same family with, with them. So yeah, we need to be careful. Next. It's okay. Because we are really close with the grid apes, it's make the potential zoonotic disease. So this is how we start. So zoonotic disease, uh, as known as zoonosis, a disease or infection which is naturally transmissible from vertebrate animals to human or human to animal. It's according to WHO. And, and also we have Classification of zoonosis, according to the etiological agent, we have bacterial, mycotic, viral, parasitic. Uh, yeah, and also the second one from based on life cycle of the disease, we have orthozoonosis. Actually, for the orthozoonosis, orthozoonosis, for the life cycle, need just one species of vertebrae just like RBS. And for the cyclozoonosis, it needs more than one species, just like tineasis, something like that. And metazoonosis, uh, it needs vertebrae and 
invertebrates, like example, like malaria or something. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you about all of this because, yeah, it's not not really my expertise, but I got it from my college. But thank you so much to my lecture. <laughs> and saprozoonosis also for the life cycle, it needs uh, vertebrae and environment to reaction, and also direction and transmission is, you can say, andropozoonosis to andropozoonosis and apixenosis. Okay, next, doctor. I will give the example in the next slide. slide. Just to prevent the disease and the zoonosis from human to orangutan or orangutan to human. So we have the guidelines. So this is our guidelines. We have strategy and rencana aksi konservasi orangutan Indonesia. This is the newest. Uh, also, we work based on IUCN. So we always update about all of this just to prevent the zoonosis disease to our center. Because as you know that we play with almost 300 orangutan, yeah? it's like a big population. So when one orangutan got the disease, it means that we have to handle, it's become very difficult for us and dangerous actually, yeah, because we have to handle a lot of uh, cases. If So we just don't want one of the cases transmit to all of us. Um, okay, next, Dr. Kutu. So based on IUCN and based on IUCN, so we make the protocol and manuals. So this is, it's like a living document. So we always update it every, every year. So we have to make uh, evaluation. We have to make what's the best for us because the situation in the field is different with the textbook, right? In the field, we have to know exactly what's happened because yeah, that's why we have a uh, like living document. This is our living document. Okay, next. And about the visitor guidelines, we are, this is one of the, our guidelines about the visitor guidelines. And we are really strict actually about the visitor because before pandemic, we have to uh, check like, a lot of a lot of pathogen in in visitor. That's why, like, uh, Mr. Panda said that visitor tourism uh, can also make the decrease of the number of orangutan. That's why we don't want any tourism. Like, we really close even for visitor. We really uh, strict with our visitor. Okay, next. Okay, so we just jump and move to my topic. So this is a uh, cases of potential zoonosis disease transmission by orangutan in our center. Okay, next. The first one is rabies. Uh, this is really, really interesting because it's not really interesting because he was my son, yeah. Rabies is fatal disease and like 99.8 uh, not survive. It's from Lisa virus, genus Lisa virus. And the rabies is one of the six zoonotic disease that most concerned in Indonesia based on Peraturan Menteri Pertahanan Republik Indonesia nomor 40 tahun 2014. And there's no further uh, information about rabies in orangutan. That's why we can say that this rabies, this is the first rabies in orangutan worldwide. So this happened in our center. It's happened in 2013. Yeah, 2013. Okay, next. So, the clinical sign, just like, uh, just like common rabies in dogs, like a weaver, loss appetite, dehydration, 
and become aggressive, restless and photophobia, unconscious and nystagmus. And our gold standard for rabies is using fluorescence antibody technique. But we uh, and the examination we did a necropsy, we found the massive inflammation in its brain. So we just shocked because uh, he was so small and just in still quarantine. That's why uh, when orangutan come first in our center, we need to quarantine first before it can spread disease to other orangutan. Okay, next. So we send the sample to Balai Veterinary Banjarbaru Laboratory in South Kalimantan. So, yeah, wait a minute. Oh, I, I can I can use pointer here. So this is the rabies positive. You can see over here. So this is the result, and we just shocked because we, we never have this experience before. Okay, next. So it's mean, uh, it doesn't mean that the case is stopped there because we still have like a seven orangutan in the same group when the orangutan had quarantine. So we check the seven orangutan who had contact with the infected orangutan. So we check with saliva, swab saliva, and also ELISA examination. And also, uh, based on journal and publication that usually in dogs, uh, rabies only needs 14 days, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, but in primates, it can stay for uh, six months. That's why, that's why uh, we extend the quarantine of the orangutan until six months. And after that, we recheck again with PCR. And also, all the medic and babysitter who had contact with infected orangutan during the quarantine uh, got treatment at the Ribi Center in Palangkaraya. This is, uh, and we got it, the treatment, we got it for free in Ribi Center because here in central Kalimantan is still endemic for rabies. That's why if we want to eradicate or eliminate the disease, we have to work together, like with the animal health and also with the human health. So we have to work together. Okay, next. And the second one, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is a zooanthropozoonosis from the direct uh, infection is from human to animal. So actually orangutan in the wild, they don't have tuberculosis. So it means this disease is really difficult and really dangerous. TB have high morbidity and mortality. And also Indonesia is an endemic for TB. So it means that confiscated orangutan will be have more risky to get TB. Yeah, and this TB is a threat to conservation sites. It's not for also the orangutan, also for the worker. And there, there is no future to release infected orangutan. This according to IUCN 2007. Like reintroduced individual must be healthy and free of any captive acquired disease that could endanger either the wild population and, or other wildlife at the introduction site. Okay, next. So we do screening annually for our orangutan like every, because Indonesian is endemic for TB. So we do annually TB test for our orangutan so like once a year. So this is how we check our orangutan. So this we do x-ray. So the TB diagnosis, we can use clinical auscultation 
uh, also we can or we can say like if the orangutan have persistent fever or not. We can also check the lungs based on X-ray, PTA, PCR, and bacterial culture. So we do bronchoalveolar lavage, bronchoalveolar lavage to find the mycobacterium culture. All tests that are correlated for diagnosing TB. So one test alone is not valid. Okay, next. So this is TB because it's a, uh, we until now, uh, we used to have nine orangutan with TB, but now it's already healthy, but we put them as XTB because we don't know exactly with the Latin TB. So there's like, like I used to end before, there's no, re, uh, no future for those kind of orangutan. That's why those kind of criteria we put in unreleasable orangutan. So it'd be difficult. We don't want the other population will get infected with this TB. So we have health management protocol for TB. The first isolated area in this area, in this area, uh, in this area, it's really strict area that uh, with this strict staff and there's no free ranging wildlife like a monkey just come and go. No, it's really strict with, uh, yeah, with, with protective wire or something like that. And second one treatment, we have to give like rimpavicin, eccentra, like a TB treatment for at least minimum for six months. It's, I think it's a little bit easier for human to, to take the drugs, but for the orangutan, they can be bored and they can feel like a boring or something. Yeah. So they, if they don't want to take the drugs, we have to start over again, start from the beginning again. But until now, it's all clear and there's no TB case anymore. So the PPE, the PPE personal protective equipment, we use single use masks and also glove. And also for the boots, we only put in those isolated area. So we don't bring this kind of PPE, go outside and go somewhere else, even though it's already become XTB and sanitation and disinfectant. So we use our normal. We, we will burn like the rubbish from the isolated area to the incinerator. And the last one, education for the medic and staff because we don't want to spread the disease to other population. So we have to educate that this is really dangerous disease because it will uh, it will destroy their future if, it, if they got tuberculosis. Next. Okay, the, okay, next is strongyloidiasis. It's caused uh, by strongyloidiasis velaborni and strongyloidiasis cercoralis. So, so this is the life circle of Strongyloidiasis. This is saprozoonotic. It means uh, the infectious agent need environment to do reproduction. Reproduction. So, and it's not a common common worm or like common worm like helminthiasis, other helminthiasis. Because even though it's just like a normal nematode, but some center orangutan center in Indonesia reported that. This is this this is kind of fatal for their orangutan. Also, we also have we used to have a lot of cases with strongyloidiasis, uh, and it's fatal. Like we lost our orangutan because of this parasite. So it is dangerous, really dangerous. And uh, Labes, this is Mbak Labes Elizabeth Labes, 2011 said that. 
most of our strongyloides stay in neuromantine circular circularis. Next. And this is still strongyloidiasis. See, uh, based on clinical sign, it's like lethargic and vomit and pale. You can see the orangutan looks so skinny, dehydrated, and also the anemic. And also it lost total protein and albumin as well. The diagnosis we use fecal examination, native centrifuge and floating. Because the treatment, uh, the treatment only, like the treatment, we can say it can work only with ivermectin, doramectin, and abendazole. It will be difficult for us because we need to rotate the medicine. It's like a limited, really limited of track of choice. That's why we have to be really careful with the strong ideas. And it's also, uh, oh yeah, I got, I had this strong ideas in my body. It become like cutaneous lymphar migraine. It's so itchy. That's why the PPE is really important for us here. Yeah, even though I wear, I wore PPE already, but I still got infected. <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> and the malaria this the malaria the it caused by plasmodium species huh? this it needs uh it need one horse one vertebrae as a horse and also invertebrate as a horse so the interesting because it's really real malaria before, before uh, in human, it's only for for plasmodium, falciparum, vivax, oval, and malaria. But since the, uh, 1965, found in Malaysia, if I'm not mistaken, we found plasmodium nolesi. We knew that plasmodium nolesi is from macaque, so it will be. It's like a uh, transmissible from vertebrate to human. And now in central Kalimantan, the first reported plasmodium nolesi is in 2013. So it's interesting because in our orangutan, we found plasmodium vivax and also plasmodium nolesi as well. So orangutan also got infected from macaque and also from human. <laughs> but the normal plasmodium in orangutan is plasmodium sylvaticum and plasmodium patechi. This is the question with these two plasmodium. Uh, we worried that in the future, this this, we will find this plasmodium in human as well. That's what we are worried about. That's why before it's transmit to human, we have to work together. So we work together with health ministry. So we got the truck, malaria truck from them and also with the local health. Also we communicate well. So if we have, we have patient with, we will communicate with local health if we have a Plasmodium, or we found plasmodium. The diagnosis based on blood smear, like here, because uh, we had the outbreak before in 19, 1998, if I'm not mistaken, or around 2000. Uh, we have out, no, sorry, 2004, if I'm not mistaken, we had like outbreak, like at the same times more than 30 orangutan at the same time got malaria together. So it's like outbreak. That's why now uh, evaluate from those case, every time we take the blood sample in our orangutan, we have to check the blood smear. Even though the orangutan show the clinical sign or no, we have to check the blood smear. So here the medic have been like, we are, we already have check like a thousand samples of blood smear. <laughs> That's the most I'm, I'm proud. <laughs> okay, next. Very nice. Okay, next. Next, uh, Putu. Yes. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, the clinical sign, high fever, usually uh, the normal temperature is same between orangutan and human. So usually they will go until 40 degrees Celsius and lethargic anime, nectacmus, and confusion when they have cerebral malaria. And the treatment, we don't use chloroquine anymore because it's already resistant based on health ministry. Uh, so we give ACT, artemisinin based combination therapy. So we got it for free. That's, that's why I love working with them. Just like one health, we help each other. So we collaborate collaboration with local health office in malaria eradication. And malaria treatment must be total and radical to reduce relapse and drug resistance. So this is our sample. Okay, next. So we also collaborating with Edgeman Institute for Molecular Biology. So Ibu Tari, uh, Ibu Tari went here and also we do surveillance in Makak and also she trained us. That's really nice of them and we learn from each other. And she just stopped because we already checked like a thousand samples, something like that. Yeah, so we learn from each other because uh, actually in, if I'm not mistaken, a uh, couple years ago, like one month, usually we got around uh, 15 cases per month. So we just so worried. Okay, next. So this is malaria. So we also do blood transfusion because they lost their blood and the hemoglobin is really low. That's why we have to do blood transfusion. So it will become difficult if we have like so many, like if we have outbreak, something like uh, a lot of cases together in one time. Okay, next. So next, hepatitis B in human. So this is same zoanthropozoonosis. The orangutan got this disease from human actually. And confiscated orangutan from human have risks to infected with hepatitis B because as we know that the small orangutan is so adorable and the owner will, will usually share the food together in one plate and we don't know exactly what the health of the owner, something like that. So that's why how the orangutan get hepatitis B. So historic uh, clinical sign, we can say from anamnesa, pale orangutan, yellowish, and in biochemistry, there's a evaluation on uh, liver function indicator. And diagnosa first, we this is one of our screening actually. So we send the sample to local laboratorium and for the next. Okay, because the local laboratorium only can detect the hepatitis and they, but they, can, they, can, they can't say which one of hepatitis because we, we know that there's a given hepatitis and also we have orangutan hepatitis and also human hepatitis. And that we are worried is human hepatitis. So we will send the, to, to each month to find exactly what kind of, and this is the human hepatitis, human hepatitis B virus. So it'd be difficult. Okay, next. And uh, AMCV, encephalomyocarditis virus. Uh, this 2014, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, 2014. So infects mammals worldwide, including human. So it's mean zoonosis, reservoir from rodent, and transmission, fecal and oral. And clinical sign are lethargic, coughing, vomit, increasing opacity of lungs, and X-ray, arrhythmia, pericardi, deep snow. And the most worried is sudden death. So we have. Uh, 11 sudden death and 
nine of them, eh, sorry, uh, we have 11 cases and nine of them were sudden death. Next. Nine of them was were sudden death because uh, in the beginning, we don't know exactly what this disease. So we have different diagnoses. We have intoxication, MCV, leptospirosis, salmonella, sigilla, strongloidiasis, coccidiasis, anthrax. And all of them were negative expert, except the MCV. And the result, seven of 11 orangutan were positive PCR MCV. From the necropsy, we found heart pale, white patches, and then infarct. Uh, something like that. So this is the lungs, eh, sorry, this is the heart. There's a infarct and the heart looks pale and also hemorrhagic and gastrointestinal. Because this is, it's still a new case, we report, report to an authorities as an exotic disease. So this is the first of MCV reported in Indonesia. Again, this happened in our center again, but this is like a couple of years ago. Until now, we don't have any more this kind of, I hope so, next. So discussion, so need different diagnosa for every sudden death. So before for the sudden death, we always like maybe intoxication or something, but now we have, we always check for MCV for every sudden death. And there's a discussion that routine MCV vaccination for all orangutan at risk. And also rodent control or rats is really crucial. And existence in the wild population or habitat. Is there any MCV in the wild? We don't know exactly. Next. Influenza, okay. Influenza orangutan are really sensitive with respiratory infection. And that's why like common flu in human can be fatal in orangutan. Like this infant, we are really strict with respiratory disease because when, uh, when we do, when, ex when the employee or staff had a sick like flu, uh, we can say uh, you, you cannot work or you need to rest or something like that because it's really dangerous for our, our orangutan. Because orangutan have complex respiratory system that connected to each other from the nasal to air succulities and to lungs is connected to each other. Because from the common flu, if you not treat the common flu, it becomes sinusitis and become air succulitis and pneumonia and the worst become bronchiectasis. And now since last year, I think, uh, yeah, last year we have 2021, we have ORDS, this, this word, orangutan respiratory disease syndrome. Like we cannot, we cannot treat them because it's too chronic and complex, too chronic and too complex. Okay, next. Also, we have other zoonosis that I cannot explain uh, one by one. We have balantidiosis just like uh, Mr. Panda mentioned before, balantidium, also salmonellosis, chromobacteriosis, entamobiasis, ringworm, etc. We also have uh, melidiosis, bucordiaria pseudomale. Actually, it's not zoonosis disease, but uh, it's rarely happen in humans. So maybe in the future, if we don't carefully, it will can affect human as well and become zoonosis. Next. Now, this is the, our final, our gong. COVID-19. So COVID-19 is caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, the COVID-19 is the latest out outbreak, yeah? And declared as the global pandemic by WHO in 2020, in January. Can, uh, can it be zoonosis? We don't know exactly at the moment, but since, to, since March 2020, we got report the first report in animal, in dogs in Hong Kong, 
COVID-19 from the owner because the owner infected with COVID-19. And also the first wildlife is happened in bronze zoo in their tiger is April, 2020. And uh, the latest news about the great apes happened in San Diego Zoo. It's happened in Gorilla in January, 2021. So uh, we have the same receptor with human and the great apes. It's like similar. So it would be, we have to be really careful, like extra, extremely careful with our population. Next. Now the question, can orangutan get infected by COVID-19? Uh, from CDC, uh, we don't get exactly in the official news, but uh, from the rumors, there's a chimpanzee and orangutans at the Dehiwala Zoo test COVID positive in Sri Lanka, but it's not reported yet in CDC. So it makes us more worried and we have to be really carefully about this pandemic. Next. So we don't want this pandemic uh, enter to our center. That's why we have really strict prevention management about COVID-19. So we have visitor restriction. So we eliminate or we just don't want any visitor at the moment. It already been like two, two years, I think, or one year and a half without visitor. And second one, we, protocol preparation and contingency plan. So we have to prepare the worst. Even though we don't have the COVID-19 in our orangutan, but we already make a site, make an enclosure for uh, orangutan with COVID-19. And we already make protocol for infected orangutan or something like that. We just prepare the worst. And Meet COVID-19 risk mitigation procedure for all of activities. So this is uh, some kind of like mitigation. So we have to reduce our uh, our work hour and something like that. And also routine COVID-19 screening for all of staff and orangutan who had close tracing from positive employee. So for the staff, we check regularly every two until four weeks per apa, one. We check every two weeks, but uh, since two months ago, since Delta virus, we check every week with antigen, using antigen tests for all, all of our stuff, just to prevent this COVID-19 comes to our center. So, and the last one, work together with all stakeholder for one health and stop the pandemic. So we work together with health ministry, we work together with uh, forestry ministry, we work together with local government, et cetera, like just to stop this pandemic. Next, the last slide, I think. Nah. The evaluation and lesson learned. So uh, standard operational procedure implementation is really important. Internal evaluation, every time there is a case, so we already make a protocol, but every time there's a case, we have to evaluate again. And also the second one, use the monthly health information as an early warning. So we have like a monthly report is become our early warning, how to handle in the future. And routine evaluation of internal SOP, which are live docu document, we can update every time. Uh, and the need for minimum operational standard for rehabilitation center. So this is really important as well that we have to uh, same standard in all of orangutan rehabilitation center in Indonesia. We have, uh, at least we have minimum operational standard for orangutan and the worker or the staff. And regular evaluation and monitoring of KSD 
DAE, including for example, sanitation and environment health in rehabilitation center, and synergy and strengthen network between rehabilitation center and zoo. And this is really important. Uh, we have to make strong connection between center and zoo because the information is become updated every minute right now. And we have to synergy with national and international veterinarian, as well as laboratories and research center, and start conducting clinical trial of potential vaccination for zoonotic disease, especially little ones. That's the most important things. Next. And this is the references. Okay, terima kasih. And salam sehat, salam lestari. Thank you. Terima kasih, salam sehat, salam lestari. Thank you very uh, much, uh, Dr. Arga. A very wonderful presentation. We got deeper, deeper insight about Post Foundation and also, of welcome. course, this topic, the zoonotic diseases in orangutan, such as rabies, uh, tuberculosis, strongyloidiasis, which is interestingly fatal for orangutan. Also, malaria, hepatitis B, which is anthropozoonosis, so they get from human. Also, encephalomyelocarditis uh, virus, or AMCV, which one of the cause of the sudden death and also influenza, which is also interestingly fatal for orangutan, and very interestingly, the last one, uh, COVID-19. So we know the clinical signs, diagnosis, and treatment, as well as the lesson learned. Uh, the protocols and manual minimum standard is present to prevent zoonotic diseases, such as quarantine before accepting, and etc. And the most important thing is that we have to work together of human and animal health and all sectors to implement one health in the field. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arga. So we go now to the next session, which is question and answer session. Um, Chitra, could you please uh, share screen? Okay, thank you. So we already have several questions here. Okay, the first question is from Prof. Wayan. <laughs> this is for Pak, pa Pak Panda. Interesting, Pak Panda. The question is, um, orangutan activities are feeding, resting, traveling. Is that like human behavior? How far orangutan can travel around the forest, on the ground, or from tree to another tree in a group? Okay, um, please, uh, Pak Panda, the time is yours. Yeah, thank you, Ropoyan, for the questions. Well, actually, this is uh, depends on the, uh, the sex class and age group. And if I can have one example, uh, in Sebangau, for the alpha male, which is uh, male dominant, they can travel for about six, uh, 560 hectares a year. So <clears throat> regarding uh, about when, in, when we convert it to the kilometer square, it's about uh, 56 kilometers square per year. Mm. So why are they you... traveling to get food? To get food or uh, to avoid the human being? Well, <clears throat> actually, they they are uh, active travel because they have to, uh, you know. Uh, uh, they travel to access food availability inside mm. and to another, and then in terms of avoiding uh, predator, which is actually the predator is human. So uh, they also develop some kind of uh, new uh, uh, behavior, like 
uh, terrestrial locomotion. So they really do it, but uh, from our camera trap, yeah, they're showing their ability to walk by the uh, four, uh, four um, what is it called? In Indonesia, Tungkai, for mo mobility uh, <laughs> tools. And we can say quadrupedal, something like that. So they will move in terms of foot availability. That's to address your questions. Thank you. Okay, next question. Okay, uh, next question, please. Thank you for the answer, Pak Panda. My pleasure. So this is from Prof. Wayan to Dr. Arga. Uh, the question is, what kinds of zoonotic pathogens so far identified in your uh, conservation center and what are the diseases burden and control of orangutan? Is there any evidence that this disease is transmitted from human to orangutan? Uh, please, Dr. Arga, time is yours. Uh, sorry, Dr. Alga, you are still muted. Can you unmute Mute. yourself? Yes, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Prof. Bayan. Actually, this interesting yeah. topic, yeah, it's an interesting question because uh, I only speak by my experience, like only do prevention, but is there any evidence actually? Yes, we have it, but Thanks to God, it's not a fatal one. Uh, I got, like I said before, I got putanius larva migrant. It's, it's caused by strong elodiasis. That's why it's so annoying, but yeah, it's still, it's still a zoonosis. And uh, it's difficult to control because every time uh, we always do like really strict with our protocol to prevent the disease, but why this is still occur in our center? That's also the question, actually. It's because maybe because the population is too high here. Uh, that's become our question again. Why it become, why is so, so, why we have so high in number of orangutan? But all mm. we can do is just to, just to prevent the disease and zoonosis. And evidence, for, sorry, evidence from human to orangutan. Oh no, there's no evidence at all. So until now, mm. because we do really strict protocol, so there's no evidence at all. Is orangutan still safe? Mm. And But we don't know exactly with the malaria, yeah, because here we work with the we work with local people here and based on each month, like uh, half of the samples are positive with plasmodium. So we don't know exactly who infected the, our orangutan. Is that from monkey or from human? We don't know exactly. Yeah. Dr. Arga, I still have another question regarding this one because very interesting. Uh, the orangutan live in the forest and a uh, lot of bats in the forest, they're sharing a food uh, from uh, uh, fruit. Uh, it is possible, maybe transmission from bat to the uh, orangutan. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, because now we are dealing with a rat, uh, with a bat and it didn't divide pathogen from many different places of bat. Maybe it could be as a reservoir of uh, zoonotic disease for human as well for uh, orangutan. Oh yes, uh, that's become our concern as well. Uh, in the wild, mm. in the wild, uh, wild orangutan, they will mm. interact with the other species. So, like uh, Mr. Panda said, that it's naturally transmissible from naturally transmissible from vertebrate to human or human to to vertebrate to other mm. 
the break ya yeah? but with with the bats because it's happen in the in the wild so we don't really make that as our concern maybe hmm. our concern when the orangutans come to our environment something like that because uh, and the, it will make cause of zoonotic and it's like the journal said it's like spill over nah yeah. that's that's why we worry when the spill over is happen but when it's happen in the their habitat so we don't exactly our concern Mbak Sastrin, may I have question due to this? Oh. Yes, uh, Prof. Jut. Prof. Jut, yeah. yeah. My question is for Mas Panda. Mas Panda, during your work at the at the forest, do you find a lot of bat in the tree of the area of your working area? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Jut. Well, actually, uh, We have found a rare occurrence of the bat in Sabangau because what we have suggest that this bat is like a migratory uh, from the other side, not stopping in the Sabangau area, but travel further north uh, for uh, to the upper upper part of the central yeah. Kalimantan. Because I think uh, Semango is lowland, yeah? So yeah. the bat live in the cave. So mm -hmm. do you have a lot of caves surrounding Semango area, mm -hmm. something like that? In Semango, we don't have any caves. But further north, we have Bukit Raya, we have Bukit Baka, where the, the potential bat is actually live there but uh, to address the question of propoyan as well bats and orangutan will have some different of nisha so what the orangutan feeding on fruits mm. it will be different from the bat Maybe. that's mm. my response to propoyan as well. So okay, thank you. only only my migratory birds, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Have you ever encountered the fruit that eating by the bat? I I personally haven't have not because the bat is uh, the 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 fly the fly pet is not on the pungwalas and the laboratorium lahan gambut, but In the in the in the center of the Sabangau, drive to the north to the Bukit Baka, Bukit Raya. My my question to Dr. Arga. Thank you, Panda. My pleasure. Yes, bro. Uh, you are muted, Prof. Jut. Prof. Jut. Okay. Are you you're still muted? Okay, my question is relating to Prof. Ryan. He already asked the question that I would like to know too. So you have the population to be rehabilitated, yeah, in your center. Yes. You said that there is like six six orangutan have TB, yeah, I think, yeah. And you said that there is no a very serious infectious disease found in the orangutan, the one you already released or still in the process to be released. Is that right? Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, in the first uh, one, we have XTB. So like 10 years ago, we the orangutan like six, apa, uh, sorry, nine orangutan have like a severe, severe symptom of tuberculosis. So it's like a persistent fever and then lethargic, like cannot move at all, etc. And after we diagnose it's a TB based on, based on uh, 
PCR, BTA, and X-ray. So we give like six month drugs, six month for, during six month, we give drug for the six month. And after that, until now, there's no clinical sign anymore. Uh, there's no clinical sign anymore uh, on this nine population of XTB. That's why, but we still put this XTB in one area that we call it isolated area because we don't know exactly uh, about the Latin TB in orangutan. We just worried in the future, the Latin TB will, uh, will relapse again and will spread to another orangutan or our population. That's why this nine orangutan, we put it as a unreleasable orangutan. That's prof. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Pak Panda and Dr. Arga, for the answer. From you welcome, uh, Prof. Actually, actually, I also have a question that uh, actually is still related with Prof. Wayan question uh, regarding the transmission from human to orangutan. You also mentioned that uh, there was uh, COVID nineteen in orangutan in Sri Lanka. And is it a zoonotic transmission or do you know uh, from uh, what source is the COVID-19 in orangutan in Sri Lanka? Thank you, Dr. Arga. <laughs> oh yes, you're welcome, Prof. Uh, first of all, the news is not official yet, actually, but I just got the link from the rumors. So it's not from the CDC, uh, but that uh, was our concern actually that uh, there's orangutan got infected by by COVID-19. So uh, I'm not sure, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, the orangutan, simpanse orangutan tiger in Sri Lanka got from the from the keepers, if I'm not mistaken, because it also happened in San Diego Zoo. Their egg gorilla got uh, had COVID-19 from their keeper. So yeah, that's why that's the most uh, reasonable where orangutan can get uh, COVID-19. So that's why in our center, we have to be really careful and really strict with our protocol. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Arga. Yeah. Okay, do you we have, have also in Ragunan. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Have in Ragunan. You're right, Prof. Yeah, I just remember it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we go to the next question. So this is from Rosa. Uh, hi, Dr. Arga. Uh, oh, she has two questions. The first question is, since you have TB in your center, have your team come across cases of meliodosis? Okay, I don't know this. this is and what can... <laughs> And what kind of COVID tests do you do in on orang outans? PCR or a rapid test kit? Thank you from Rosa. So with the Sabah. Okay, uh, please, yes. Dr. Arga. Okay, thank you, uh, Miss Rosa. So yeah, uh, there's no cross case between melidiosis and TB actually, but we know exactly there's a different symptom of TB and melidiosis. And the TB was was like years ago, like 10 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, before I come to this center. But melidiosis, also we have around, around seven, yeah, seven melidiosis. It's Bucorderia pseudomalae. Uh, we found it in liver, in that orangutan in necropsy, that's why it's not gross. Yeah, it's so heartbreaking with melidiosis, but but we have to be still very really careful. And also the second question: what kind of COVID test do you do on orangutan? So actually, we do screening, COVID-19 screening on orangutan with double check. So we check with uh 
rapid mm-hmm. rapid antigen and also we check mm-hmm. the PCR. So it just like to to validate the antigen just for validating the result. But the golden standard is PCR. We work together with local hospital, like one hour from here. It mean it's easier for us to send the sample and it's easier for us to communicate with the staff in hospital. That's why, and also for the, for the primer in PCR, they use the same primer, primer as well for orangutan and for humans. So I think it's, it's our advantage. So we check uh, with PCR and rapid antigen. Thank you, Ms. Rosa. Thank you, Dr. Arga. I think uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ms. Rosa, uh, do you have response of Dr. Arga? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Arga. Okay, we continue to the next question. Uh, this is from Amanda Yonika. Uh, the question to Dr. Arga, is there any information or any updates about orangutan COVID-19 vaccines? So this is about the vaccine. Please, Dr. Arga. Okay. First of all, about the vaccination in wildlife orangutan is not our right because it's uh, we need to we need the uh, acceptance from the government because orangutan belong to government. Yeah, orangutan belong to government. And but from the updates, uh, actually we. Uh, I, I don't know. It's my place to say or no, but yeah, we from the vaccine. I think we have discussed with San Diego Zoo, all of the rehab center uh, in Indonesia, uh, discussed with San Diego Zoo that they also vaccine gorilla, orangutan, chimpanzee in their zoo using vaccine from zoetis, something like that. So. But we're still not sure should we do vaccination in our orangutan first. Uh, before that, we maybe we have to check the antibody first or something like that. So that's the update, actually. Hai, sahabat Agropedia, sebelum masuk ke inti video kita hari ini. Okay, thank so, you, Dr. Arga, yeah, for answer. Uh, I think, uh, Amanda, do you have more questions to Dr. Arga? Are you still there, Amanda Yonika? I think this is one of our students. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's enough. Thank you, Dr. Arga. Yes, you're welcome. Okay, thank you for the question, Amanda, and thank you for the answer, Dr. Arga. We continue you to the next question. I think this is the last. Oh, no, we still, oh, we still have th- three questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is from Elizabeth to Dr. Arga again. <laughs> so, thank you for a nice presentation, Dr. Arga. Uh, you mentioned that EMCV in your center was the first report in Indonesia. In your opinion, where and how did the orangutan get the virus? Okay, please, Dr. So, yeah, actually, the uh, yeah, I have to share my experience because at the moment there's a a lot of rats because at the moment I don't know why there's a lot of rats at the moment. Uh, I think because rats is one of the reservoir of the AMCV. And the second one, we have the nearby, uh, what you call it, uh, peternakan babi, like a pigs, pigs, uh, like the people start to lose their pig the pig have a sudden death and they don't give a report to us or to to local government we know we know there's a dead pigs like after we got the case so but if if we know exactly there's a like outbreak dead pigs outbreak near our center so maybe we, we can prevent this MCV, I think from the, I think from the dead pig and then with the, a lot of rats and it's become in fact our orangutan. 
Okay, but then, yeah, it is interesting because MCV is not, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, it's not deadly in human. So it's similar to strongyloides and um, I think so. Uh, yeah, influenza yes. that you said, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, it's different, <laughs> different effect. Yeah. And uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Arga. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have more questions? Okay, thank you. So we continue to the next question. Oh, this is from Amanda again to Dr. Arga. Is there any consideration about the difficulty to get access to the lab from the rehabilitation center? How do you keep the sample to get the most accurate result? Okay, Dr. Arga, time is yours. Okay, yes. Uh, yes, actually for, we have, uh, yeah, that's really our challenging, yeah, with the, with the access to go to the lab. That's why it depends from the lab. The first for the COVID-19, we don't have any difficulty, difficulties because it's easy to go, go to hospital. But if we want to send the other sample to some laboratorium in Java, especially in this pandemic, uh, in this pandemic, before before pandemic, we can send the sample only uh, one day, one day service, something like that. But now this pandemic, the fastest, uh, they say like three days. So it will be difficult for us to send like three days, something like that. So that's why before we send the sample COVID-19 to, to laboratorium in Java, but now because the, the challenge, so now we send it to local government, yes. So how do you keep the sample to get the most accurate result? Yeah, we, we have to take again to our guidelines, like it's depend from the sample. Usually we will use uh, ice, a lot of ice, just like a really small sample, like really small sample like this, but we give like, two kilos ice or something like that, <laughs> just to keep it cold. I hope that is still accurate when it's arrived to laboratory. Thank you, Ms. Amanda. Thank you, Dr. Arga and Amanda for the question. So I think it's already three o'clock. So we are uh, yeah, out of time. So I think uh, for the last question, we don't, uh, continue and uh, we will uh, I will give, give back the screen to Putu please Putu yes thank you very much Sastrin I can ask my question by my myself I will contact the Arga <laughs> oh that was your question <laughs> the last one last one <laughs> the last is one Putu question <laughs> But it's okay, but it's okay. Thank you very much. You can ask Once privately. <laughs> yeah, we can do what's up. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, it's, once again, Sastrin. Uh, your classmate would do. Nice... Uh, what is again, Prof? Uh, Arga is your classmate? <laughs> no, yeah. actually, no, I, I think uh, he's our senior. Our senior, uh, yeah. yeah. Senior, uh, okay. <laughs> Because I have his uh, his WhatsApp number, so I can contact by myself <laughs> and mm. get more longer discussion. Because um, today we have a very nice discussion. Once again, thank you very much, Sastrin. And thank you very much for our awesome speakers. Maybe I can ask the thumbs up and or like a applause sticker from, from all of the participants. And I will go first. Thank you very much. For Pak Panda and also Dr. Arka, uh, we learned a lot about orangutan and, and its behavior, the conflicts, the ecology, and also the zoonotic disease that can be spread by the orangutan. Thank you very much. And this is the end of the session. I know that all of you is waiting for the, um, the, uh, the attendance form because all of you waited waiting for this, right? But before that, uh, please turn on your video because I want to take a picture with all of our speakers. So, okay, we will wait. And after this, uh, 
For the session, I would like to ask Prof. Wayan to close the session and um, we will end the session and we will share also the attendance form. Okay, so now once by one, I can see all of the participants. Thank you very much. And I still see some of you didn't turn on your video, especially for the Muslim woman. I know that all of you still have a problem with your hijab, right? <laughs> you are still turn on, turn on your video. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same problem with me, Prof, <laughs> because I am the house now, so I let my hijab on, so I can turn it on and off all the time that I want. Okay, so I will take a picture from the first screen, so please keep your smile, because uh, you don't know which screen are you on. We have four screens, so we will go to the first screen. Okay, wait a minute. One, two, and three. Once again, one, two, and three. To the second uh, screen, one, two, and three. Once again, one, two, and three. To the third screen, one, two, and three. Once again, one, two, and three. And the last one, one, two, and three. One, two, and three. Thank you very much. Um, Prof. Ayan, can I have your a short closing um, speech before we end up the session? Prof. Ayan, please. Okay, thank you, Butu. On behalf of the One Health Corporating Center and Indohun, I would like to thank for all of you, that uh, uh, especially for the two speakers, Dr. Panda and Dr. Arga. Thank you for you uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, I think this is very important one to understand uh, for all of us about the uh, orangutan and the disease uh, transmission from orangutan to the human being. Uh, maybe next time, if we have time, uh, for those of you who ne never been in Kalimantan, please just say hello to Dr. Arga. And after the, uh, he opened the uh, orangutan conservation or orangutan uh, over there, maybe we can visit him uh, or Dr. Panda. Dr. Panda, Pak Panda is uh, uh, in Kalimantan. In... Therefore, I would like to thank for all of you from Udayana, from UB Malang, from UGM, from IPA, IPB, and also from Malaysia, and also one from UK. I thank you for your participation of this uh, webinar. Uh, tomorrow we have we will have another one uh, on the, on uh, commemorating the uh, Rabies Day. We have a Rabies uh, webinar for tomorrow. Maybe for those of you who want to need more input about Rabies, please join our webinar for tomorrow. Thank you so much for your attendance. And once again, thank you, Pak Panda. Thank you, Dr. Arga. Uh, thank you for your uh, sharing of, with us. Thank you so much again. Okay, yeah. Putu, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Prof. Ayan. So this is the end of the session. And this is the link for your attendance. And please, uh, Sastrin or Chitra, you can uh, share the link in the chat. So all of the participants can simply just click um, the link so they can fill on the form and we will open it maybe for one hour. So I think one hour is enough for all of you to fill the form and we will um, send the certificate and also the material. We already get the material from the speakers and we will send it around one week after uh, this webinar, after today. And uh, as already just mentioned with uh, Provian that tomorrow we will have a webinar which is commemorating the World Rabies Day 2021. And if you would like to join with us, um, just kindly register yourself to bit.ly slash rabies2021. And we will have it on 2 uh, a.m. GMT plus 7. And see you tomorrow. Once again, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arga, Pak Panda, and Prof. Ayan, and everyone who is joining the webinar today. And be happy and stay healthy. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. To